Hi, and welcome to this webcast. My name is Duncan Epping. I'm a chief technologist working for the storage and availability business unit within VMware. Today, I'm going to be talking about the innovation that we are doing beyond hyperconverged infrastructure, and more specifically, what we are doing to make sure that you as an administrator can go to that next level of efficiency. Some of the functionality you're about to see and some of the features you're about to see are going to be either in beta or in tech preview. So please don't make any purchasing decisions based on what's going to be shown in the upcoming 30 minutes. Now, I realize that a lot of you have been around for a while and those who have been around for a while may recognize this screen. This screen is from a ESX 2.54 server and it actually allowed us to manage the, uh, the servers from a hardware perspective, but potentially also from a virtual machine standpoint. In a lot of cases, life was fairly simple back then. I would say, you know, life was easy. Uh, we had a couple of hosts, potentially a couple of virtual machines per host. In a lot of cases, just 10 or 15 virtual machines per host. And some of the challenges that we had back in those days were things like uh, virtual machine time drift, where we had to ensure that on the ESXi host, NTP was configured, and within the guest, we had VMware tools installed. Those were some of the more challenging problems that we had. Now, if you look at the world today, I think it's fair to say that a lot has been changing over the past 10 years, but a lot more is going to be changing in the upcoming five years. Research has actually shown that in the upcoming five years, we'll be deploying more applications and solutions than we have done in the past 40 years. Now, if you look at back, if you look back at the work that you've done in the past 12 months, and then realize that that is probably going to double or triple in the upcoming years, I think it's fair to say that things will become a lot more complex and a lot more hectic. So why is that? Well, first of all, there's a shift happening within the industry. Uh, realize that this is not the case for all of you. Uh, but I can tell you that we're starting to see a lot more customers getting involved with these homegrown distributed solution, solutions based on things like microservices or container technologies. In the past, a lot of you would just buy off-the-shelf hardware, which typically was a monolithic app, typically a large monolithic app installed and configured within a single virtual machine. But what we're starting to see right now is that a lot of customers are starting to develop their own solutions and as a result more virtual machines and more applications will need to be managed as well. Now that's not the only thing we're starting to see. We're also starting to see these, this emergence of IoT devices and IDC has actually predicted that there will be 50 billion IoT devices by 2020. Now in a lot of those cases you as the administrator, the virtual infrastructure administrator will not be responsible for managing those devices. However, the data of those devices and potentially the processing of that data as well may be uh, part of your responsibility or at least the infrastructure where that data needs to be processed may be part of your responsibility because that is also something that we're starting to see. Of course, in a lot of cases, it doesn't make sense to ship all of the data being produced by these devices out to a centralized environment. In most cases, this data will be centralized right at the edge, right at where the IoT devices are actually sitting. So that may also be a change that is going to occur for you in the upcoming years. On top of that, we're also starting to see a rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And actually, the spending according to IDC uh, is going up to 46 billion, with it, which is truly an enormous uh, amount. And, and, and I suspect that a lot of you will start seeing these types of solutions being deployed on premises or potentially within a cloud in the near future as well. Now, I think it's fair to say that based on what we've just seen, that the world is moving at an extremely rapid pace. We've all experienced it in the past couple of years with the emergence of uh, hyperconverged computing, things like object storage, and you know things have changed massively. However, if you look at a lot of the infrastructures, I think it's fair to say that a lot of you are still doing the things that you were doing 10 years ago. For instance, creating a LUN, or potentially deploying virtual machines based on a spreadsheet that has been flying around for a while, where it actually states how much disk capacity is available on a particular data store, or on which particular cluster you should be deploying a virtual machine. On top of that, I'm afraid that a lot of you are probably still uh, configuring and installing ESXi based on uh, potentially outdated documentation. So no form of automation is being used. At least that's what, what I've been seeing uh, in a lot of customer scenarios. And I think it's fair to say that if you realize that we're going to be deploying a lot more applications in the upcoming uh, years to come than we have done in the past 40 years, 
that's something we'll need to change from an infrastructure perspective as well. We need to make sure that life for you as an administrator is going to be simple. And that is actually something that we as VMware have been doing over the past couple of years, or what I probably should say the past 20 years. We started out with a hypervisor that allowed you to virtualize physical machines and allowed you to manage those virtual instances through a simple uh, interface. After that, we released something called virtual infrastructure, which is now uh, called vSphere. And that contained solutions that allowed you to essentially manage multiple clusters in one go. On top of that, provided you things like HA and DRS that allowed you and uh, that allowed the infrastructure to automatically load balance and automatically restart virtual machines uh, when failures occurred. More recently, uh, we introduced what we refer to as the third version or the third iteration of VMware, which is called the Software Defined Data Center. And in the Software Defined Data Center, what we did is on top of allowing you, providing you the ability to manage multiple vSphere instances. Uh, we also provided you the ability, for instance, to virtualize the network through NSX and to virtualize the storage through vSAN. We also introduced a new management layer on top of vSphere, which is called the vRealize suite. And the fourth version that we are now moving towards is something that I think is going to be really important in the upcoming years, especially when we are starting to implement the hybrid cloud. As soon as we start looking at hybrid cloud infrastructures, I think the key thing here is going to be globally consistent infrastructure, but more important, globally consistent operations. Whether you are running your workloads in an edge location or potentially running it on uh, VMware Cloud and AWS, that should be completely besides the point. The management and the operations for those workloads should uh, be consistent. Now, hyperconverged, of course, is going to be a big part of that and has been a big part of that. As you can see, uh, we have over 15,000 customers leveraging vSAN uh, as it is right now. And more importantly, or probably equally as important, 500 cloud partners are leveraging vSAN, which provides us a 34% market share. Uh, two of which I'm very proud are the two big public cloud providers are leveraging vSAN for their offerings, VMware Cloud and AWS and IBM. I think it's fair to say that vSAN has been uh, very successful the past uh, couple of years. And as you can see, a whole bunch of customers are listed uh, on this slide as well. A lot of familiar names for you who are all using vSAN technology in their data centers as it is right now. Okay, that all sounds cool, but I think what I would like to do right now is I would like to go through a couple of projects which I think are very uh, interesting and that will hopefully make your life a lot easier. First of all, I would like to discuss Elastic vSAN, and this is part of the VMware Cloud and AWS offering and makes you a lot more flexible in terms of uh, the amount of capacity that you have to your disposal. The second thing that I would like to discuss is Kubernetes, or more specifically uh, VMware PKS, and how we can deploy Kubernetes environments on top of a VMware Cloud foundation-based infrastructure. And then last but not least, I would like to give you a nice tech preview of vSAN file services, which is going to be in beta hopefully soon. So the first one, VMware Cloud and AWS and uh, uh, Elastic vSAN. Most of you are probably aware what VMware Cloud and AWS is, and in my opinion, it is the easiest and the fastest way to consume an SDDC. The great thing about this solution is that it's managed by uh, VMware and by Amazon. So if, for instance, a, a firmware update uh, needs to be applied, then VMware and Amazon are going to be responsible for that. But for instance, also VMware patches. So if there's a new version of vSphere or a new version of vCenter, then VMware will apply those patches uh, for you. You take care of the workloads, we take care of the rest. And I think that is the strength of this particular platform. Now, this particular platform comes in a couple of uh, flavors, or actually comes in a, uh, a, a specific configuration, I should say. Uh, if you look at the default cluster, which is a four-host cluster, it comes with 144 CPU cores. Now, if you look at the maximum cluster size, that results in close to 1,200 CPU cores. Now, of course, it also has storage uh, within that particular environment, and in this case, of course, it's going to be vSAN storage. We start off with a 40 terabyte raw capacity, and we can grow all the way up to 320 terabytes raw capacity. Now, we spoke to a lot of customers, and some of our customers said, okay, 320 terabytes sounds like a lot, but we have databases that, for a single instance, consume more than 320 terabytes. So we would like to have the ability to expand, dynamically grow, 
and potentially shrink as well this capacity. What can you do uh, for us in that particular case? And that is something that we've been working on in the past couple of months. What we have been working on is something that we refer to as Elastic vSAN. And through Elastic vSAN, what we are actually doing is we're leveraging native Amazon technology to allow you to uh, provide some form of elasticity from a uh, storage capacity point of view. So we're connecting Amazon EBS devices over the network into uh, uh, vSphere itself and consume them as proper uh, vSAN disk groups. Now, it has a couple of advantages, not only from a scaling perspective, but also what happens during a host failure. And I think that's probably the more interesting part for you as an administrator, because you know us as geeks are always interested in finding out what happens when something fails. So what I'm going to show you right now is a cool demo where I'm going to uh, examine an Elastic vSAN cluster, but then I'm going to introduce a host failure and show you as well what's going to happen from a recovery point of view. Let's switch over to the demo. Okay, in this particular case, we have a VMware Cloud on AWS environment, so I'm going to go to host and clusters and show you what it looks like. If I click on configure, you can see that vSAN has already been configured, and in this case, the .8 hosts has multiple disk groups. If I click on the disk group, I can see that the disk group has four uh, disks in use, and those are local NVMe devices, or actually, they are recognized as a local NVMe devices, but if I inspect it closer, I can see that this local NVMe device is actually backed by an Amazon Elastic Block Store device. So this is a device that is connected over the network into ESXi and then consumed as a local device. So although vSAN seems to think it's a local device, this device is actually presented over the network. Now, the cool thing about that, as I said, is it provides you a lot of elasticity a, from a, a capacity standpoint, but also what it will bring you is a cool availability feature. So let's have a look at what happens when something fails. In this particular case, I have failed 32.8, and as soon as 32.8 has failed, you can see that virtual machines are starting to become disconnected. On top of that, not only are virtual machines disconnected, also data will have reduced availability. This, of course, is because of the fact that the EBS devices that were connected to dot eight are now uh, missing. So all of the components or all of the virtual machine components that were sitting on that particular host have also gone missing. If I click on the refresh, what you can see is that vSphere HA instantly starts restarting those virtual machines that were impacted. And literally within a couple of seconds, virtual machines are up and running again. So from an application standpoint, life is good again virtual machines and applications have become available. However, the, the hosts itself is still uh, marked as failed and the data, of course, is still marked as a reduced availability. Now, the cool thing is the following when it comes to VMware Cloud and AWS is that it has the ability to automatically add hosts to the cluster. And that is what it's doing right now. We're going to add the dot nine host into the cluster so that from a compute perspective, we are back where we started. So we now have four hosts from a compute point of view available. On top of that, we're also removing the dot eight host uh, from the cluster itself because the host has, has had, had failed. It wasn't uh, useful anymore. Now, when that has happened, of course, what we also are capable of doing is introducing a new host into the cluster that will have the original EBS devices attached to it. So in this particular case, we're introducing the dot eight host into the cluster. And what I'm going to do you uh, going to do is I'm going to show you what happens in this case instantly. As you can see, all of the components start becoming healthy. Some of the com components still show as a reduced availability, and that is probably because data is still resyncing. We now need to resync the delta between what has changed during the failure uh, to that point in time after the failure we, when we reintroduce the EBS devices into the cluster. As you can see, data has completed, uh, completed uh, syncing. So we're going to go back to virtual objects and hopefully it will show all of them healthy. And as you can see, all of the virtual machines and all of the components are healthy once again. Now, if I click refresh, the dot nine host that was introduced from a compute perspective is moved out of the cluster and we are back to a healthy uh, cluster again. So not only does EBS give you uh, a great flexibility from a capacity standpoint, it also gives you a lot of flexibility and additional availability during failure scenarios. And that is the first demo that I wanted to show you today. Let's go back to the slides. 
The next thing I would like to discuss is how you as an administrator can start supporting cloud native workloads through VMware Cloud Foundation and VMware PKS. We're starting to see a massive shift in the industry. I've already mentioned that a lot of our customers are starting to adopt these cloud native technologies. And over the past year, it has actually grown with 200%. And this is cloud native technologies, uh, the adoption of cloud native technologies in general. For VMware specifically, if you look at the amount of cloud native applications being deployed on VMware, it has grown from 1% in 2017 to 24% in the last year, so in 2018. This is a massive growth for us. So that also means that it's not just those startups that are leveraging these new technologies, but it's a lot of the enterprise organizations and mid-market that are starting to leverage these technologies as well. That by itself, of course, introduces a lot of new challenges and potentially a lot of complexity because most of these solutions, these cloud native solutions, are deployed on top of Kubernetes. And if you look at this diagram, which is a typical Kubernetes environment, you can start to see how complex it can become quickly. Not only do we have all of these different new uh, terminologies and acronyms, uh, but on top of that, we also see some part of the traditional environment still being needed. Things like, for instance, local storage or NFS. And that poses a lot of challenges. And this is one of the reasons what, that we've also seen that in a lot of IT organizations, these new roles have started emerging. In some cases, they are called uh, site reliability engineers. In some cases, customers refer to them as the DevOps, or, or, team, the DevOps team. One thing, though, is, 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 is very clear, and that's that these newer roles typically are responsible for managing and maintaining, for instance, Kubernetes. The developers are consuming what they have been exposing, but you as the virtualization administrator are still responsible for the virtual infrastructure. Now, I can imagine that in a lot of cases, your organization may not be large enough to start, the, uh, start uh, hiring additional uh, people to manage, for instance, a Kubernetes cluster. So if that is the case, what can you do? Well, we as VMware, we released a, uh, a product called VMA PKS, and VMA PKS, in my opinion, is one of the easiest ways to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. Not only does it provide you a Kubernetes cluster, but it does so uh, with uh, the additional integration, for instance, with VMA NSX. It also includes uh, our uh, uh, container registry called uh, called Harbor. So if you don't want to use a, a, a public registry to store uh, your container images, you can leverage our container uh, registry, which will be deployed on premises. Now, Kubernetes uh, by itself fairly complex to install and configure. VMware PKS not so much. But what we did over the past couple of months is we actually introduced an easy button into VMware Cloud on AEW or VMware Cloud Foundation. And for those who don't know what VMware Cloud Foundation is, in my opinion, it is the simplest way to consume an SDDC on premises. When you deploy and configure uh, Cloud Foundation, what will actually happen is that not only will we be, will we be configuring uh, uh, VMware, uh, vSphere completely for you, but on top of that also the storage components, so vSAN, but also, for instance, NSX, and if you would like to have some of these other uh, management components integrated, like the vRealize suite, that is also something that VMware Cloud Foundation can bring to you. Now, as I said, we've introduced the easy uh, button. So what I would like to show you is a cool demo that basically shows you how easy and how simple it is to deploy VMA PKS in a VMA Cloud Foundation environment. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to create a template that defines a VMA PKS deployment. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to deploy that VMA PKS template on top of VMA Cloud Foundation. So let's shift over to the demo. Okay, this is our SDDC manager interface. And the SDDC manager interface is what comes natively with VMware Cloud Foundation. Now, within the SDDC manager interface, we have an option called catalog. And within the catalog, what we can do is we can actually create a PKS container template. And as soon as we've defined this template, what we can now start doing is consistently create new PKS environments or Kubernetes clusters. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to provide a name for this particular template. And then, of course, we're going to specify the number of container instances that we would like to have to our disposal. The size will need to be mentioned and, of course, the number of namespaces that we need. 
The next thing that we'll need to do is we'll need to specify the availability zone names. So we're going to specify an availability zone name for the management zone and of course for the container zone as well. Then next, what we will need to do is we'll need to specify some of the security details. We'll have a password for the PKS appliance and of course we'll have a password for the Kubernetes worker username and we'll have a, uh, a Kubernetes worker password as well. On top of that, we'll need to specify the DevOps admin username and of course the DevOps admin password. After we've done that, we can, re we can review the settings and we can click finish. So now we've created a simple template. The next thing that we could do is deploy this template. So that is what I'm going to show you. I'm going to deploy this template in a workload domain. And this workload domain is a VMware Cloud Foundation uh, construct, as I will show you in a, a couple of minutes. So I'm going to click next. I've selected the workload domain. And now what I will need to do is I will need to select the resource pool. I'm going to select the resource pool for the management zone. And of course, I will need to select the network as well for the management zone. So I'm selecting a particular overlay network. I've specified what the IP address range will be. And now I'm going to move over to the container zone. So I'll specify which resource pool will be used for the container zone, which network will need to be used for the container zone on top of that. And of course, which IP range needs to be used. Then the next part that I will need to fill out is what the address is for the authentication service. And what I'm going to do, and I think this is something that is very cool, I'm going to specify the email address of the, of the developer that will start leveraging or start consuming this Kubernetes cluster. So I fill out the email address, and as soon as it has been deployed, what's going to happen is that VMA Cloud Foundation is going to send an email to this particular developer, and the developer will have all of the details in, uh, in, in that particular email to start consuming the, uh, the Kubernetes clusters through the APIs as he normally wishes to. Now, we've just clicked finished, so it's now being deployed. And if we go to the work or to the workload domain, we can see that it already has been deployed. So in this particular case, as you can see, we have PKS deployed, but on top of that, we also have PCF operations managers, operations manager, and we have PCF boss deployed as part of the PKS offering. And that is it. That is all that it took to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. So as you can imagine, in this particular case, we don't need a DevOps team or we don't need a dedicated um, Kubernetes administrator to provide a Kubernetes cluster to our uh, developers. So let's switch back to the slides and let's start discussing this last, last section of the presentation. So the last thing I would like to discuss with you is a scalable and affordable file service solution through vSAN file services. Now, as, as I've already mentioned, this is not available yet. This is going to be in beta pretty soon. And you may ask yourself, why is VMA moving into this space? Well, we have been doing vSAN for a while now. We started out in 2014, and a lot of our customers were asking us if we had a file services solution uh, for them. Because in a lot of cases, they were using tra traditional storage uh, solutions that were providing uh, both file services but also block services. And what they would like to do is actually combine those two in a single fully software-defined solution, mainly to reduce management complexity, but also to provide them the same scalability they have from a block perspective through vSAN for file as well. And of course, that will result in a lower total cost of ownership. On top of that, I've already mentioned cloud-native workloads, so I'm not going to discuss uh, this in depth, but these cloud-native workloads typically need to have some form of uh, persistent storage to store state. Yes, I realize that a lot of people seem to think that cloud native workloads are all stateless, but reality is that a lot of these workloads are not stateless and need to form, uh, need to store some form of state somewhere. And this typically is going to be a file share. Now, what we've been working on over the past uh, uh, year or past two years probably is a new solution that allows you to share uh, both uh, your vSAN environment for block as well as for file. Now, the great thing about this is that it is an environment that you, need, that you don't need to separately manage. And we're not going to be deploying uh, multiple appliances for you to manage as well. Although we will be deploying agent virtual machines, these agent virtual machines are going to be managed by VMware and are not going to be managed by you as the administrator. Now, what is the most interesting part here, in my opinion, is that this file share solution will be able to leverage the vSAN storage policies. So if you are a customer that, for instance, has a stretched uh, cluster environment, you can simply attach a stretched cluster 
policy uh, to your file share and make sure that your file share is stretched across locations and potentially protected within the locations as well. And that would happen on the same exact same platform as where the virtual machines are sitting. So you could have virtual machines with a, a specific policy and you could potentially have a file service with a different type of policy literally sitting next to each other on the same host or potentially within the same cluster. Okay, you know, enough talk. What I would like to show you is basically what that would look like within a uh, vSAN environment. So in this demo, I'm going to show you how to enable the vSAN file services. I'm also going to create an NFS file share, and then I'm going to connect to that particular file share as well. So you kind of get a feeling of what the end-to-end -end solution would look like. Let's switch over to the demo. Okay. What you are seeing here is a traditional or a normal vSAN environment, but it is slightly different than what you've seen so far because this vSAN environment actually has the ability to enable vSAN file services. As you can see, vSAN file services right now is disabled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click enable and then I'm going to fill out a couple of details that are required to enable uh, vSAN file services. First of all, I need to make sure that I connect it to a domain. Of course, I need to specify what the DNS server is, and I also need to specify the Active Directory username and the password. Now, I'm going to click Next, and then what I will need to do is I'll need to fill out some of the networking details. Now, I need to fill out this, these networking details because we're actually instantiating agent virtual machines, and these agent virtual machines need to be connected to the uh, network in some shape or form. So I'm selecting a, uh, a port group, and then I'm going to fill out the subnet mask, the gateway, and of course, I will need to fill out the IP addresses that these agent virtual machines will need as well. Now, I can fill out the DNS names, but I can also simply click look up DNS because my network administrator has already filled out the, uh, the, the, full, uh, the full names into the DNS server. vCenter server simply does a DNS lookup and fills it out automatically for me. Life is really easy. I'm going to click finish and then the agent virtual machines are going to be deployed. So as you can see, all of a sudden, a resource pool pops up, agent virtual machines, and now vSAN file services has been enabled. But of course, that's only part of it because now we've just enabled file services, we also need to have a file share. So I'm going to go to the file services share section, and then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to click add, I'm going to fill out the details required to create a file share. I need to have a name, of course, I can attach a policy to it. Here, I could actually change it, for instance, and I could leverage a stretch cluster policy or anything else that I have to my disposal. I'm going to leave it to the default, but you know, if I would like to, I can change that. I could also fill out a, a warning threshold. So depending on the amount of uh, capacity I have to my disposal, I can fill out a warning threshold and a hard quota for my consumers of this particular uh, file share. Next thing I will need to do is I'll need to fill out who the owner is of this uh, of this file share. So I'm going to give the owner read, write and execute permissions. And I'm also going to specify the group that has access to this file share. And I'm also going to give that read, write and execute permissions. If I would like to, I can also give others permissions to this, to this file share, but I'm not going to do that. The other option that I have is that I can specify a complete subset or a number of IP addresses that only have access to this file share. I'm going to click allow all uh, access, but if we would like to restrict it, I have the ability to restrict it. So next, next finish, and now I have a file share created. A couple of simple steps to uh, to create a file share. So the only thing I need to do next is connect uh, to the file share. So I'm going to switch over uh, to my uh, to my bash interface, and what I'm going to do next is I'm going to type the commands that are required to connect to this NFS uh, share. First of all, I'm, to create, I'm going to create a, a folder, and after I've created the folder, I'm going to mount the, uh, the file share to this folder. So, mounting it, and then of course, I can walk over, I can uh, change directories, and move over to the folder, and I can see that my file share has been mounted. And with that, a couple of simple steps. First of all, to create, or to enable, vSAN file services, secondly, creating a file share, and thirdly, connecting to the file share. And hopefully that shows how simple and how powerful this solution will be over time. And now let's go back to the slides. And with that, hopefully I've been able to show you in the past 30 minutes or so what it is that we are doing to make your life a lot easier 
Of course, in my opinion, these are three very exciting projects. The first being vSend file services, allowing you to create file shares in a similar way you are now deploying virtual machines through the power of policy-based management. The second, of course, being the easy button for deploying Kubernetes clusters, leveraging VMware PKS and VMware Cloud Foundation. And then the last but not least, Elastic vSend, allowing for scalability, flexibility, and availability within cloud environments I personally haven't seen before. With that, I would like to start wrapping it up, but before I let you go, there's one more thing I want to mention, and that is the fact that we released vSAN 6.7 Update 1 a couple of months ago. There's a whole list of cool features that were introduced in Update 1, but there's a couple which I think are worth pointing out. The first being the Update Manager Enhancements, because these allow you to update and upgrade both the firmware and the BIOS using Update Manager for disk controllers. The second, of course, being the automated space reclamation or also known as Unmap, because this now allows you to, to reclaim space from within the guest. So if someone deletes a large file, that space can now be reclaimed and can be provisioned to other virtual machines or other file systems potentially in the future as well. Now, with that, hopefully it's clear that VMware ATI powers any application anywhere, whether that's the Edge, on-prem, private cloud, or public cloud. I would like to thank you for attending my session, and I hope to see you next time.